In March 1998, screenwriter Jonathan Hensley was due to begin what was to be his directorial debut, adapting Marvel Comics Hulk into a big-screen, big-budget blockbuster. $20 million had already been spent on pre-production work, and studio bosses were looking to pit the Hulk against Tim Burton's Superman Lives in a box office showdown of comic book titans. In an interview with Premiere magazine, when asked how things were going, Hensley replied, They're talking about chopping 20 to 25 million dollars off the budget. I have to go into a dark corner and redream the script to get as much entertainment value as possible within those constraints. If anyone in this industry thinks that I'm working on Hulk indefinitely, they should seek psychiatric help. Such a response makes you ask, what happened there then? Well, if we rewind seven years earlier, it's 1991, and Avi Arid, a businessman, marketeer, and rights holder, had come into affiliation with Marvel through his work in the design and sale of toys, notably the Uncanny X-Men action figures, released by the company Toy Biz. Mr. Arid worked hard to reinvent himself, rising through the ranks from street hustler to become a one-man entertainment conglomerate. After years of selling ideas to virtually all the major toy manufacturers, he would eventually sign a deal to work exclusively with Toy Biz, a three-year-old toy company in New York that at the time became a 46% owned subsidiary of Marvel Entertainment Group. The deal gave him 10% of Toy Biz. Mr. Arid told the New York Times his mission was to exploit the Marvel universe of comic book characters in a synergistic network of toys, video games, films, and television shows. Toy Biz has a complicated history with Marvel. Following its initial license deal, the company signed an exclusive perpetual royalty-free license agreement with Marvel in exchange for a percentage of Toy Biz's overall equity a move which brought Ike Palmata and Avi Arid, co-owner of Toy Biz, into Marvel's overall corporate leadership structure, allowing them to later win control over Marvel in the wake of the company's bankruptcy in 1996, a deal that would leave Marvel bondholders high and dry. The bondholders denounced the Marvel merger with Toy Biz Incorporated as a outrageous sweetheart deal for the banks and for Toy Biz insiders at the expense of Marvel shareholders and bondholders. But back in 1992, Arid had already noted the press were reporting on ambitious plans to conduct a new theme park adjacent to Universal Studios, Florida. By 1993, it would eventually be decided that one area of the future Islands of Adventure theme park would be themed after Marvel Comics, with the popular Hulk superhero being selected for its flagship thrill ride, the Incredible Hulk Coaster. The excitement surrounding the project gave Arid all the incentive he needed to renew Universal's about-to-expire option for the screen rights to the Hulk. Arid hoped to fast-track production, and if things were to go as planned, 1998 would see Hulk playing at cinemas in the summer blockbuster slot, whilst capitalizing on the grand opening of the Hulk roller coaster ride. With all the hype, hope, golden source material, and free publicity, what could go wrong? Well, first, let's answer the question, who exactly is the Hulk? To establish a timeline of events, we need to roll back the years to when Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine had become a huge success and proved it was a time of monsters. In 1960, airing of classic Universal monster movies on TV, Creature Features, inspired a popular line of model kits from Aurora Plastics. They made the Frankenstein models. They followed it up with Dracula, the Wolfman, and the Hunchback of Notre Dame. When Marvel Comics publisher Martin Goodman read that Aurora's Frankenstein model kits had sold more than a million units, he sensed an opportunistic cash-in was there for the taking, and he instructed editor Stan Lee to instantly start a comic book featuring a Frankensteinian monster. Kirby said, The Hulk was my creation. It was simply Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I was borrowing from the classics. They're the most powerful literature there is. As long as we're experimenting with radioactivity, there's no telling what may happen, or how much our advancements in science may cost us. The Hulk was Frankenstein. Frankenstein can rip up the place. And the Hulk could never remember who he formerly was. 
My, I, I got my idea for the Hulk I, I, when I created the Hulk. Uh, my idea for the, for the Hulk didn't come from any fanciful... Didn't come from any fanciful, uh, des- you know, place or anywhere. It, it came from a mother <clears throat> whose child was crawling out from under the fender of an automobile to the sidewalk. Uh, the kid wasn't any more than two years old. Mm-hmm. And this panicked the mother when she saw her child under the car. And so the mother went to, she ran to the back of the car and she lifted up that the entire car from the back mm-hmm. because she had that strength of desperation. And when I saw that, uh, you know, uh, it, it suddenly dawned on me that there was a character there uh-huh. uh, that, that's inside all of us, that when we become enraged, that we can bend steel. I've done that myself. And so, uh, there it was, right in front of me. Uh-huh. And uh, 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 that's how the idea for the Hulk came about. Lee agrees, saying, I know I was influenced by Jekyll and Hyde and Frankenstein when I first did The Hulk. I always felt that the monster was really the good guy. When I was a kid, I loved the Frankenstein movie, the one with Boris Karloff. I hadn't read the book. The movie was what really grabbed me. And I always felt that the monster, that that the role that Karloff played, he was the good guy. He didn't want to hurt anybody. He didn't know what he was doing. The poor guy was taken from the dead. He had a brain slapped into him. And, and, it, and all these idiots with torches used to chase him up and down the hills. And he didn't know where to go or what to do. And I thought, I bet it would be fun to try to get a character who's kind of a monster, but he's really good. But just because he looks and acts like a monster, people hate him, fear him, hunt him, and try to destroy him. Lee recalls putting a great deal of work into naming the brutish creature, saying, Now, of course, even a monster needs a name. The name is important, because you have to convey the entire essence of your concept in a word or two. I wanted a name that conjured up an intimidating, gargantuan behemoth with a plodding brain and enormous power. So, I turned to the two other classics, the Dictionary and the Thesaurus. I needed a name for this monstrous, potentially murderous, hulking brute who... Wait. Hulking brute was the exact description. And initially, I knew hulking was the adjective. Well, it wasn't much of a stretch to go from hulking to hulk, which sounded like the perfect noun. Lee had used the name before on characters ranging from robots to alien monsters to Wild West heavies. Elsewhere, he admitted to being inspired by a half-forgotten 1940s comic book monster called The Heap. Kirby famously did much of the heavy lifting, often without appropriate credit, and the artist would always insist it was he who conceived of the Hulk. With the Incredible Hulk, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby made a monster for a man. Colorist Stan Goldburn told Alter Ego, I certainly didn't plan to make him red. And we kicked around the idea of making him green, but Stan wanted to try grey. I fought him on that. I told him why it wouldn't work, and it didn't work, because we couldn't keep the colour consistent throughout the book. Sometimes the Hulk was different shades of grey, and even green in one panel. If we hadn't already made the thing orange, that would have been the perfect colour for the Hulk. Lee began referring, for more than a couple of months, to the Incredible Hulk's alter ego as Bob Banner, rather than Bruce Banner that he originally named. Responding to criticism of the goof, Stan Lee, in 1961's issue 28 of the Fantastic Four, laid out how he was going to handle the situation. There's only one thing to do. We're not going to take the cowardly way out. From now on, his name is Robert Bruce Banner, so he can't go wrong no matter what we call him. Later, in 1963, Thor's troublesome brother Loki used him to ensnare the God of Thunder into a trap. Accidentally creating the Avengers, the Hulk was inducted as a founding member, but the rough-spoken Hulk never quite fit in and soon turned renegade. 
After a classic two-part battle with the Fantastic Four and the Avengers, the Hulk was awarded a new strip in the back of Tales to Astonish, supporting his former Avengers teammate, Giant Man. Ditko returned to draw the character, in the process creating the first gamma-powered super foe in the Hulk's history. The leader was a janitor who, after exposure to gamma radiation, turns into a kind of reverse Hulk. Instead of becoming a green monster, though, he mutated into an emerald genius with a super brain. The leader would continue to plague the Hulk for some years to come. Picking up Ditko's storylines, Kirby reclaimed his creation after only a year's absence. Kirby expanded the Hulk's horizons beyond his New Mexico stomping grounds. Also, at this time, the Hulk came into being whenever Banner grew agitated and angry. Additionally, a new supporting character, Major Glenn Talbot, began to suspect a Hulk-Banner connection whilst vying with Bruce for Betty's affections. For a time, Bill Everett drew the strip, then John Buscema. Jill Kane stepped in for a memorable flock of stories in which was created the Hulk's second major gamma-spawned foe, the lizard-like Abomination. Marie Severin took over, and it was during Severin's tenure that Tales to Astonish was renamed The Incredible Hulk in 1968. The Hulk had his own book once more. Many artists inked Severin's pencils, but the one who stands out in retrospect is Herb Trim who took over the penciling himself with the Incredible Hulk issue 108, the issue in which Lee reclaimed scripting duties from interim writer Gary Friedrich. You've seen these on the stands? This is Stan Lee. We use college-level vocabulary. If we want to use words like uh, proselytize, uh, misanthropic, we go ahead and we do it, and we don't worry about the young kids, and we find that they enjoy the stories as much as the older ones, but we've encouraged an entire older audience to read comics too, which may be good or it may be bad. But when you say misanthropic, there's always a picture of a misanthropic person right there. If you can draw a misanthropic, you're pretty good. Incredible Hulk! From Marvel Comics. The Hulk, he has a little problem, too. He turns into a monster whenever he least expects it. Thank yeah, you very much, Stan, for uh, sharing these uh, with us. I appreciate it. Best of luck in the, uh, in the film enterprise Thank of Marvel you. Comics. During Trimp's eight-year reign, a fourth Gamma-created supporting player was introduced. Doc Sampson was a green-haired research scientist turned semi-superhero whom the Hulk alternatively battled and befriended. By this time, Roy Thomas was writing the feature, with Trimp serving in an active co-writing role. One of the most poignant chapters in the life of the Hulk came from fantasists Harlan Ellison and Thomas. In The Incredible Hulk, issue 140, the Hulk enters a subatomic world inhabited by green-skinned humanoids who are ruled by a benevolent princess, Jorella. Here, the Hulk finds not only the acceptance he craves, but also the love of Jorella. He manages to retain the intelligence and emotions of Banner while using the Hulk's prodigious strength to protect Jorella and her people, although the Hulk slash Banner ultimately ends up mourning Jorella's death. In time, Trimp was replaced by John Buscema's brother, Sal. Writers came and went. It was Milgram who, in 1986, reintroduced the concept of the Grey Hulk into the series with issue 324. Meanwhile, Rick Jones was briefly turned into a new version of the Green Hulk. A year later, Peter David took over as scripter, with Todd McFarlane as his artist. A new creative golden age was ushered in. Backed up by artists Jeff Purves and Dale Keown, David splintered the Hulk into several fascinating incarnations. The grey-skinned Hulk metamorphosized into a cunning character named Joe Fixit, who operated as a shady Las Vegas underworld figure. Fixit wore tailored suits and transformed back to Banner each dawn. The Professor was a green-skinned Super Hulk who possessed Banner's genius intellect. He first appeared during another Doc Sampson attempt to cure the Hulk, when Banner and the Green and Grey Hulks merged. During the Mantelope period, it was suggested that Banner suffered from multiple personality disorder as a result of childhood abuse at its father's hands, saying, 
It's one of the most common root causes of multiple personality. And what is the Hulk if not multiple personality? It's all there. Once I took over the book, the story was very much a guiding force for me in terms of the direction I went. If you go back and reread the stuff, you'll find that there are always little allusions and references to what happened to Bruce Banner as a child, references made both by Bruce and by the Hulk. The estate of comic book artist Jack Kirby would later bring a case to assert rights in a number of works appearing in Marvel editions between 1958 and 1963 that he had co-created. However, the United States District Court Southern District of New York determined that Marvel held the copyright in the works created by Mr. Kirby. It held that Mr. Kirby's work qualifies as a work for hire under the U.S. Copyright Act of 1909, which governs work made before January 1st, 1978. Mr. Kirby had been paid a flat per-page rate for the artwork and scripts he and other freelance artists and writers produced in line with plots, outlines, or scripts provided by Stan Lee, Marvel's long-standard editor-in-chief. The court concluded that Mr. Kirby did not create the artwork until Stan Lee told him to, and so did not own the copyright in those works. While Kirby could not have anticipated the widespread and enduring popularity of the superheroes he co-created, nor the subsequent evolution of copyright law, this case offers a sultry lesson on how important it is for creators to understand the ins and outs of copyright law, as well as the need to future-proof the strategic management of their works. Jack's grandson, Jeremy, released previously unseen artwork, a Hulk-like concept designed by Kirby for a new character called Ram, the Man Mountain. That what made your work so tremendous, you know, I really, when it comes right down to it, it doesn't matter whether or not, uh, you know, who exactly did what, although it would be interesting to know whether or not Galactus's exit speech in FF number 50 was an example of Jack's dialogue or stands. But you well, just say this. Every word of dialogue in those scripts was mine. <laughs> I don't want every to, story. St and I don't want to get into controversy about that. What I want to uh, stress to you and to anyone who would be hearing this is that you two gents together, when you said the whole equals more than the sum of its parts, it is very true. I think that that was the success behind the Beatles, behind the Birds, behind many of the, the rock groups. There seems to be... I can tell you that I wrote a few lines myself above every... I yes, I've seen those. They weren't printed in the book. All right, look, both of you, hey, kids, both Listen, of you guys. Jack isn't wrong by his own lights because, Jack, answer me truthfully. I wasn't allowed to write. Did you ever read one of the stories after it was finished? I don't think you did. I don't think you ever read one of my stories. I think you were always busy drawing the next one. You never read the book when it was finished. Dialogue, Stanley. Huh? Let me get in there with him. Press it in my own dialogue. <laughs> and, uh... That, I think that's the way people are. So uh, whatever was written in them uh, was, insic well, it, 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 you know, uh, it was the action I was interested in. I know, and I really think, and look, Jack, nobody has more respect for you than I do, and you know that, but I don't think you ever felt that the dialogue was that important. And I think you felt, well, it doesn't matter. Anybody can put the dialogue in. It's what I'm drawing that matters. And maybe you're right. I don't agree with it, but maybe you're right. No, I, I'm, I'm only trying to say is that I, you know, I, uh, I think that uh, the human being is very important. If one man is, is writing and drawing and, and uh, doing a strip, uh, it, it should come from an individual. I believe that you should have the opportunity uh, to do the entire thing yourself. You know, when you mention when you mention an ego problem, the funny thing is, I'm afraid those problems are only cropping up now. I think when Jack and I did the strips, uh, there was no ego problem. We were just doing the best we could at the time. Well, but I just want to say that Jack has, I think, made a tremendous mark on American culture, if not on world culture. And I think he should be incredibly proud and pleased with himself. And uh, I want to wish him all the best, him and his wife, Roz, and his family. And I hope that 10 years from now, I'll be in some town somewhere listening to a tribute to his 80th birthday. And I hope I'll have an opportunity to call at that time and wish him well then, too. Jack, I love you. Well, the same here, Stan. But, uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Stan. The design of a big-screen Hulk continued. 
Up until this point, in the mid-90s, the Hulk had already appeared on small screen in both live-action and animated forms across the previous three decades. The Incredible Hulk debuted on television in a two-hour pilot movie on November the 4th, 1977. The series' 80 episodes were originally broadcast by CBS over five seasons from 1978 to 1982. The series aired on the CBS television network. The show was great. It was made with genuine craft and the loyalty of its enduring fan base reflects such. That was directed and written by Kenneth, I forget his last name, but he was brilliant. He was smart enough not to have the Hulk speak. You know, when I used to write the stories, the Hulk would say, me smash or Hulk smash, you know. I, I needed some dialogue balloon to throw in. <laughs> but he knew it would sound corny, so he didn't have the Hulk speak at all. And he had Bill Bixby playing David Banner. And Lou Ferrigno was perfect as the monster. And the stories were good. And you only saw the Hulk for about maybe three minutes in the whole half hour, but you waited it, and women went mad. When there was that scene where his shoulders, that the shirt started to tear and his shoulder was getting big, everything about it, it was a good show, a very good show. Lou Ferrigno spoke of how he and Bill Bixby were about to relaunch the show after the 1990s The Death of the Incredible Hulk, saying... We were about to come back with The Revenge of the Hulk, where they found a blood cell that enabled them to bring me back to life. It has been reported that the fourth film would have featured the Hulk with Banner's mind, and that the project was cancelled because of Bill's struggle with illness. I got a phone call. They said they were casting for the Hulk, which, I, I mean, I was, like, blown away. They were filming the pilot. You knew Richard Keel, who played George on James Bond. And Richard Keel was a big guy. He was, like, 7'2", but he didn't have the physique. And one day a director came on the set with his son. And the boy said to, to, to his father, the director, he said, Daddy, that's not the Hulk. And the, fa and the father said, why? And he said, the boy said, the Hulk has got to be big, big, huge muscle. They started to get nervous to realize that they had to find the right person to play the Hulk because they knew the show would be in trouble. When I went down for the screen test, I knew I had this part because when they saw my physique, my body, and I was able to show different emotion without speaking, able to cry and everything, then I knew I landed the part. And to have that part, knowing that it was something I've been dreaming about for 20 years as a little boy, reading the comics, fantasized to becoming the Hulk, it was kind of like a dream coming true. Also bringing the character of Thor, and bringing the character of Daredevil, the wonderful idea. Well, I think eventually we're going to have the Hulk start speaking. Eventually, it would have left to that point. We're going to do a movie called The Revenge of the Hulk, where Bill's mind is in the Hulk's body. It's going to be a wonderful twist to the character, but then Bill got sick and passed away. Di Pego has since felt the need to refute both these claims as fan rumours, pointing out that Bixby's health had not yet begun to decline at the time the film was cancelled. Di Pego said that the plot for the revenge of the Incredible Hulk began with Banner being revived, but no longer able to change into the Hulk. Banner then begins to work for the government in order to prevent accidents like the one that turned him into the Hulk, but is captured by villains who is coerced into turning their agents into Hulk-like beings. According to Di Pego, at the film's climax, Banner would be forced to recreate the accident that transformed him into the Hulk in order to stop the villain's plans. The sequel was cancelled because of disappointing ratings for the death of the Incredible Hulk. ...is suddenly interrupted by... ...the Hulk! A big Hulk on big cereal! Honeycomb, you better come through! Brace yourself, Hulk! Honeycomb's big! It's got a big bite that tastes right! Big enough for a Hulk? Just try it! Post Honeycomb cereal big! And part of balanced breakfast! The animated Hulk also became a staple of kids' cartoon programming over the years. First starring in The Incredible Hulk from 1966 with Paul Soles as Banner and Max Ferguson as the Hulk. Then in 1982, there was The Incredible Hulk, starring Michael Bell as Banner and Bob Holt as Hulk. Ron Perlman would voice the role in The Fantastic Four from 1994 and Iron Man in 1996. 
And that brings us back up to the point in time when Universal's big screen, Hulk, has been given the green light to proceed. Writer Michael France was brought on board first. The screenwriter of Stallone's Cliffhanger would also pen unproduced drafts of The Punisher and Fantastic Four. He was first to be invited to work on Hulk in 1995, following a meeting with Arad and Stan Lee. France says the studio had been eager for him to write the Hulk into a storyline that would see Dr. Banner and his monstrous counterpart save America from terrorists, being that the political landscape of the early 90s was dominated by the Gulf War and Operation Desert Shield. The We're beginning a new era. This new era can be full of promise, an age of freedom, a time of peace for all peoples. But if history teaches us anything, it is that we must resist aggression or it will destroy our freedoms. Incredible Hulk featured a Liberation Day storyline where the Hulk and Pantheon have broken into Fort Shear to try and rescue his old girlfriend, Susan Jacobson, who has been imprisoned for giving CIA information to Israel. Nick Fury intercepts the jailbreak before realizing that, in fact, Israel needed the information to prevent a chemical weapons attack in that region. Fury points out how the United States imprisoned Susan to appease their allies in the Middle Eastern country. Fury threatens to resign from S.H.I.E.L.D. and take this information directly to the press. The topical elements and politics never made it past decision stages. The writer disliked the idea and nothing was ever written up into a treatment. The idea would instead make its way into a game, The Incredible Hulk, Pantheon, released on PlayStation and Sega Saturn in 1996. Lifelong Hulk fan and new screenwriter John Terman was now brought onto the project after receiving Stan Lee's full blessing. Veteran Hollywood executive Gail Ann Hurd had already now signed onto Oversea Production, followed by her husband, screenwriter Jonathan Hensley, writer of The Rock and Armageddon, who would serve in the capacity as a producer also. John Terman was the first screenwriter to write a full draft, following a pitch meeting in 1995. He was working with then Universal executive Carl D'Angelo and after a debate over the physics of time travel, they realized they were both fans of comics. D'Angelo told Terman that Universal was trying to do The Hulk. Even though Universal was looking for a big-name writer to work the project, D'Angelo got the newcomer in the door to pitch his ideas to Stan Lee and producer Gail Ann Hurd. Terman says, I felt I knew how to do it, and I wrote up a few pages thinking that they would just buy the pages for a grand and tell me to get lost. After my pitch, I was so sure that I wasn't going to get the job that I took out my beat-up copy of Hulk Episode 1 and said to Stan, I'll never see you again. Could you please sign this? I think it helped that I was such a legitimate fan that I could really talk comics with Stan Lee. I knew the difference between a comic and a film, and I could talk movies with the producers in the studio. I focused on the difference between a popular comic series that's run 400 issues and a self-contained story that makes or breaks a film. Terman was hired and would go on to work on the script for the next two years, turning in several drafts. His takes were heavily influenced by the Tales to Astonish issues, which pitted the Hulk against General Ross and the military, saying, The idea of setting it on a military installation, the idea of making Ross and Talbot and Betty a big part of Banner's life and the Hulk's life hadn't been done in the series on television. I saw it as Jekyll and Hyde at Los Alamos or at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. Terman said he also tried to incorporate one element from Peter David's acclaimed run on the comic. I tried to work in the Hulk's father. I always felt that the human element of the Hulk is the most interesting. What is the source of this guy's pain and anger? Terman's script opens with Bruce Banner surrounded by the U.S. Army being urged to give himself up. We cut away to two months prior, Banner in a science lab working alongside his assistant, Edward Leder. Their project is to harness a new energy source. Banner says, Gamma technology will make nuclear power look like a candle in a cave. Banner's project is refused funding and closed down. General Thunderbolt Ross orders the dismantling of the Gamma machine. We learn that Leder has been working as a double agent, selling the secrets of Banner's work to a self-styled revolutionary terrorist organization looking to build a Gamma bomb. 
Banner reacquaint with his childhood friend Betty Ross, daughter of General Ross and now a trained special agent. As the test site and Banner's life work is dismantled, the device is accidentally activated. Banner spots teenager Rick Jones riding a motorbike in the radius of the G-bomb. Banner hops into a jeep and speeds to the scene. Banner saves Rick. Back in the lab, Leda watches. He allows the countdown to continue. Three, two, one, boom. Banner is caught up in a technicolor explosion, brighter than a thousand suns. Pale green light washes through his entire body, illuminating each and every cell. Leda attempts to flee. He is exposed to the radiation. Liquid metal pours from destroyed canisters. Leda is covered in radioactive gloop. He rubs his forehead and his fingernails turn green. Banner awakes in hospital. Seemingly fine, no side effects, no burns, no radiation sickness. The military doctor, Doc Sampson, is fascinated. It's a medical miracle. As Thunderbolt Ross suggests, maybe this wimp's tougher than I gave him credit for. Leda frames Banner and Rick for initiating the detonation sequence and all manner of crimes against the military. Leda is transforming from a once meek, weakly individual into a bright-eyed figure of strength and confidence. His intelligence sharpens. He loses himself in an intellectual fugue as he plots out his intention to utilize gamma power on a global scale. Banner and Rick escape to the detonation facility and now find themselves on the run in Las Vegas. They try to keep a low profile, but end up in a scuffle with some drunken cowboys and a nightclub bouncer. The bouncer makes Banner angry, and suddenly the doorframe splinters apart as Banner transforms into the Hulk throwing biker and cowboys around like ragdolls. Sirens, helicopters, and a media circus flood the scene. The Hulk shrinks back into Banner. Banner sees men being carried off on stretchers and wonders what happened. Leda's intelligence grows at an exponential rate. He takes control of the Gamma Bomb and begins a new experiment, aimed at reducing all matter to dust. The Feds, the Army, and Betty are now all looking for Banner. A second Hulk out in a casino attracts attention. Banner flees. He tries simply to be alone. We find ourselves back at the start of the story. Banner surrounded and being urged to surrender himself to the Army. Three, two, one. Dr. Banner is gone, and in his place is the unreasoning and angry, brutish Hulk. The army open heavy fire, but the angrier Hulk gets, the bigger and stronger he grows. Leda's plan is now close to completion. He has harvested a prison camp full of what he calls patriotic volunteers, waiting to be turned into Leda's army of cyber soldiers, a seven-foot-tall mix of man and machine. The Hulk evades the military, facing off against Leda's super soldiers. Leda overpowers the Hulk, captures Banner, offering him a chance to remain in the form of the Hulk forever, to combine Hulk's strength with a neutral link directly to Leda's brain. Leda is impressed by the possibility, but Banner hulks out, bigger than ever before. The super soldiers return to fight, but Hulk tears them apart, smashing their armor to pieces. He releases the experimented on prisoners and overpowers Leda. The Gamma Lab is detonated to explode. Leda, on his last legs, refuses to cooperate and decode the timer. Bruce races off to manually dismantle the core. Bruce climbs inside and begins to take apart the bomb. He grows weaker with each step of the process. Banner starts to slowly weaken and die as the Hulk now permanently takes his place. The Hulk walks out of the devastated and destroyed laboratory. He walks past the free prisoners, past Leda, past Doc Sampson, past General Ross, without emotion, memory, or understanding. He walks past Betty. Maybe he recognizes her. Maybe he doesn't. The Hulk wanders off into the desert. He tries simply to be alone. Rick Jones follows. Hey, wait up. The end. The studio was not so taken with the idea. Terman pushed to have the father figure in the story. Eventually, he was ordered to eliminate it. I was not able to sell them on making that a bigger part of the film. I had completed my work by the time Ang Lee came out, but when I heard that that was an important part of it to him, I was very encouraged. I was thrilled as a fan to see these characters more than I was thrilled as a screenwriter.
By 1997, Terman was off the project. For a fan, working on something you're so invested in is a mixed blessing. There's the old saying, be careful what you wish for. Terman says, When I was starting out, I could not have imagined a more dream job than the chance to adapt the Hulk for a movie. But doing it was very painful because it meant a lot to me as a kid and you become attached. You soon realise that it's a group effort, that it's not yours. The attachment can break your heart. With Terman officially off the team, Universal now reconnected with Michael Franz, offering the screenwriter another chance to draft his ideas. Franz recalls a telephone conversation with producer Hensley, where he was told that Joe Johnson was being courted to direct and contracts were due to be signed. What should have been a celebration for the writer quickly proved to be the opposite, as France was let go without explanation before even putting pen to paper and told that Hensley would be writing the script since his previous collaboration with family favourite Jumanji had proved so fruitful. France got paid but told interviewers that wasn't the point. He wanted to write the film, looking to the 60s Hulk for inspiration. Here's the director, Joe Johnson, addressing the situation on the Projection Booth podcast. I had read that you were in, and I don't know how close you were or if this is even true, that you almost directed the, uh, the Hulk movie. Well, there was, a, there was a whole different incarnation of the Hulk way back when, and I guess it would would have been 96. And it was um, Jonathan Hensley who uh, wrote Jumanji, and I had developed this idea for the Hulk. And Mark Platt, who was, I guess he was head of production at Universal at the time, wanted me to direct it. And I said, I'm not going to direct it, but I will develop it with Jonathan. We had this idea that we both liked. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll help him develop it. I'm not going to direct it. He says, well, Platt said, well, I know that when, you know, you get this script written, uh, when Jonathan gets it written, you're going to love it so much, you're going to want to direct it. I said, no, I'm not really going to want to direct it. But he just wouldn't let go of the idea of me directing it. And then Chuck Gordon uh, one day sent me a script called Rocket Boys that Lewis Collick had written. And I read it in one sitting, which I never do. It usually takes me days to read a script. But I read it. I, I mean, I, I couldn't. I couldn't put it down. You know, I couldn't stop turning pages. And I called Chuck in the middle of the night, and didn't get him. I called him at you know, I don't know, eleven o'clock or something. No answer. I called him the next morning at like eight, and I said, Chuck, you cannot send this to anybody else. I said, I'm going to do this movie. He says, he says, great, does Platt know? I said, no, I'm going to tell him. <laughs> he says, he's not going to be happy because he wants me to do the Hulk. So I don't know what happened to that version of the Hulk. If it morphed into some other version, the Ang Lee version, or I don't know what happened to it, but I was, I was off in Tennessee shortly thereafter. Universal thought they had landed Jumanji director Joe Johnson and screenwriter Jonathan Hensley for The Incredible Hulk. But after Johnson's departure, it was suggested that Hensley step up to the plate and direct Hulk as his debut feature. Writer Zach Penn was then hired. That genre is incredibly rich in terms of there are certain beats that always occur in those stories, and not because people don't have good imaginations and can't come up with something. It's because you want to see those moments. Actually, a better example would be Jekyll and Hyde, which we wrote about a lot. Mm -hmm. Stories about, horror stories about a person fighting against himself. Um, That's something I've revisited many times. Obviously, writing The Hulk uh, is is very much a Jekyll and Hyde story. Um, You know, uh, Altered States is a great Jekyll and Hyde story. Uh, I always cite one of the best ones ever told. I think Cronenberg's remake of The Fly is a perfect Jekyll and Hyde movie, posing as a science fiction movie. Um, and one of, one of the things you realize when you analyze those movies is certain beats occur in every good version of that story and don't occur in the bad versions. Like, there is always a moment where Jekyll begs his best friend, his lover, whatever, to kill him, to stop Hyde by sacrificing himself. Mm-hmm. And that's not because that's what audiences expect. That's not because there's no rule book that says it has to be. It's that that's the deepest place that story can go, and yes. you got to go there. Yes. And so if you start to understand that about genre, 
it can be incredibly helpful when you have an idea to say, okay, I know this is a Jekyll and Hyde story. Am I taking it where the genre, you know, this genre has been explored. Is it helpful to me to help me turn this from an idea into a full story? The answer is usually yes. The writer later said, my draft of the first Hulk opened with him already have transformed into the Hulk. It opened with him at a roadside bar with these guys picking on him and saying, don't make me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. And then transforming and then you flash back to reveal how it all happened. Penn's drafts were ultimately rejected too, and Hensley rewrote everything from scratch, coming up with a brand new storyline, using dialogue polish from J.J. Abrams and character punch-ups by Edward writers Scott Alexander and Larry Karazutsky. Hensley's shooting draft begins with a pre-credits montage. A prisoner named Hector is given a last-second stay of execution before going to the gas chamber. The same happens with a prisoner named Novak, saved from the electric chair. A convict named Deacon is spared last second from a gallows hanging. We meet Bruce Banner, working on a top-level project, looking to establish the first colonies on Mars. The three reprieved prisoners are Banner's new volunteer subjects, on which he is to test and prepare for the trip to space, using gamma radiation to increase their metabolism, strength and performance. In particular, Banner's work is to isolate and extract the genes from the carpenter ant, the Hercules beetle, and the Pacific hummingbird. The convict patients are put through surgery. Novak fakes a seizure and plans their escape. A fight breaks out between Banner and Novak near the gamma reactor. The reactor blows, catching everyone in the blast. Banner and the convicts are treated and monitored under hospital guard. Each man now displays strange signs of genetic abnormalities. The trio engineer a daring escape and are soon loose and on the run. Retreating to a low-key motel, they are surrounded by police and a huge battle of gunfire breaks out. Under duress, the convicts begin to morph into their respective hummingbird, beetle, and hybrid forms. Back at the laboratory, Banner realizes his experiments have effectively worked. Banner joins the pursuit of the mutant trio. Banner experiences his first Hulk out whilst driving. The Hulk gets into an altercation at a redneck bar before squaring off against the mutated villains. Not only that, but the mysterious, monstrous, incredible Hulk is now under napalm attack from the military. Hector, the hummingbird, now has a huge, muscular frame, a beak, and a powerful wingspan. Hulk dispatches of Hector before taking on Novak, now something of a human torch, emanating lava. The Hulk lifts a street lamp out of the ground and swings it like a baseball bat, sending Novak falling, flaming, crashing into the river. Two done, one to go. Deacon is now a 12-foot mutant beetle monster with an insect exoskeleton and giant sharpened pincers. The Hulk and Deacon clash. Each traded blow creates untold amounts of damage to the landscape. Deacon detonates a rocket with the intention of it killing hundreds of thousands of civilians. The battle continues. Hulk gets the upper hand. He directs the rocket at Deacon, blasting him with fire. Deacon is lifted from the ground. He's pulled into the rocket's engine intake and blasted into a thousand pieces. Banner outraces the ensuing explosion. Peace is restored, and Dr. Bruce Banner now looks to an uncertain future. The end. Roll credits. The script was approved wholeheartedly and became the go-to manual for the next few months, around which sets, costumes, locations, and effects could be based. Gregory Sporleader was cast as Novak, while ex-gladiator Lynn Red Williams was cast as convict Deacon. And then Universal's chairman at the time, Casey Silver, was fired following a run of titles that were considered box office underperformers. According to senior execs at Universal, Silver's problem at the studio was also his perceived lack of being firm with directors who brought projects in over budget and behind a schedule. Director Martin Brest was given final cut on Meet Joe Black, ultimately turning in a nearly three-hour, slow-paced drama that drew critical ire and cost nearly $100 million. George Miller shot and edited much of Babe, Pig in the City in his native Australia. 
When the Babe premiere, set for November 15th, was absurdly cancelled, insiders at Universal said that executives had not even seen a print until early November. Other films regarded as misfires during the year included Primary Colors, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Mercury Rising, and Out of Sight. In that position, you have to risk enmity, and you try to do it with diplomacy and respect, said one executive, unsurprised at the decision. Now, did you, did you work on The Hulk? The Hulk is, uh, yeah, I, did. <laughs> I worked on The Hulk. Yeah, the Hulk, the Hulk is a tough one to describe because it was a real, it was a tough part of my career. It, that was a Joe Johnston project. It was, Joe had been brought on. They asked me to write it. And they, uh, Mark Platt, who was, uh, who was the head of production then of Universal at the time, Mark was the head of production at, at uh, TriStar and Sony when we did Jumanji. So when Mark moved over to Universal, he wanted to get the Hulk going and he wanted to get it going with the Jumanji team, Joe Johnston and I. So Joe came on to direct the movie and I came on to write it with sort of a loose attachment the deal was was for Joe and I to sort of bandy about ideas and come up with a plot line, and then if we liked it a lot, we'd go for it, mm -hmm. and we'd sign pay and play deal, pay and play deals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Joe left to do something else. I can't remember what it was, but he he left on off on another project, and I, right in the middle of my of, of me executing the screenplay. Would that have been October Sky around that time? It was before that. Before that, I, I can't remember. But Casey Silver then who was then the president of production. I can't remember if he, I can't remember what the hierarchy was at right. the time. He had read what I was doing with the Hulk and very much liked it and asked me if I wanted to direct it. And so I came on as the director and we went into pre-production. Casey then was fired and the whole regime at Universal was tossed out and a new regime came in and they did not look favorably upon the old regime's projects and it stalled, and you know I had another one of these executive shift nightmares. Right, that's it's kind of hard to deal with because it's so out of your control. It's you know one minute uh, you're you're writing for one set of notes, and the next minute the whole regime's gone, and you know it, it seems like it happens more and more lately. But it is happening more and more, and I don't think it's clearly it's not good for Hollywood, and it's it's. Uh, there's nothing to be said. It's just a regrettable part of my career, and it's, you know, hopefully it won't happen again, but... Hensley gave further interviews on why the film's pre-production went down in flames, saying, The budget had been high. It had always been hovering around $100 million, and they were trying to get me to cut the script to take it lower. They wanted me to stay on the project and continue to rewrite the script to make the budget lower, and I just said, I've been on this project for a year. I can't wait around unless I have a 100% commitment that you're going to make it. And they couldn't really do that. They were in transition. So I just said, listen, I've got to move on. Gail, of course, stayed with it, and a few years later, Ang Lee attached, and that was that. Hulk nearly, I know it will sound melodramatic, but it nearly broke me, letting everyone down. Look, we were all crewed up. We had a full crew. We spent millions in pre-production, some obscene amounts of money. I've never really talked about it, frankly, and looking back on it, I think on the Hulk at the time, I was probably too green, and I don't know what kind of movie I would have made. I really dare not speculate. But things have worked out great, you know? Artist Benton Dew revealed concept art he created around this time, saying on his blog, the first version I did was a bid that ILM was doing to get work on a 1997 version of the Hulk. This one was to be directed by Jonathan Hensley and featured some monster types as the bad guys. We did quite a few pencil sketches to get an idea of what he might look like. I did an expression chart as well as a Photoshop comp to give an idea of what the green guy might look like. I did a version of the Hulk that was kind of Neanderthalish. My idea here was being that the Hulk should be to Banner what a kitten is to a lion. This version never got made. I also did a Photoshopped version with Billy Crudup as the Hulk. Early on, Crudup was slated to play Banner before changing his mind and dropping out of the project. Uh, Hulk was even, you know, I've worked on three different Hulk projects, um, actually. One of them didn't get made, uh, and I think it probably was a good thing, because I don't think that uh, effects were ready to do what they needed to do um, at that time, and I don't think the script was all that good. And then 
after that, uh, Ang Lee came up with his, and I, I worked on some early concepts for that when ILM was bidding on that project. And then when Lou Leterrier did his version, um, uh, I helped storyboard that out. So I've worked on three different Hulk projects. And, uh, but I think the best one, best Hulk that I've seen was the one that was in the Avengers. And I hope that, you know, I'm, they, they try it one more time. And I think by then, They'll actually, I think they'll they'll get it right because there's 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 good things about you know the first two Hulk films, but I think uh, and there's but there's also weaknesses as well. I think they I think by the time they get it in the next one, I think they'll they'll really have it going because I, I think they really did a good job with the Hulk on on Avengers. Special effects maestro Steve Johnson released clips and photographs from the pre-production of Hensley's Incredible Hulk and would tell bloodydisgusting.com We were breaking new ground on that film. We really were. It was great and talking about it makes me want to cry because it was so cool and it never saw the light of day. This was in the infancy of digital. Nobody trusted digital back then, so we were only going to use digital for really wide shots where the Hulk and these creatures were going to do things that you couldn't possibly do otherwise. He had an animatronic head, and his arms were crossed over his chest inside the suit. And we had these huge arms that were strung and kinetically weighed so that as he walked, they would just swing naturally while he walked on lifts. It was amazing. It was so cool. In the basement of the laboratory was all sorts of rejects. All sorts of scientists kept their failed experiments down there. There were all of these big, fat humans that couldn't even stand up, so they had to lay in hammocks. Kind of like an island of Dr. Moreau kind of thing. There was all this weird stuff down there. Then there was Super Hulk. In those days, one Hulk wasn't enough. You had to have a Super Hulk for the climax. Super Hulk was some abomination of the gamma rays that was Hulk's nemesis, and it was four times the size of Hulk, and we were actually building that as well. Can you believe it? I mean, it was Jurassic Park level. It was 30 feet tall. It was crazy. The scope of the project had Johnson and his team developing some of the biggest animatronics ever imagined. The pièce de résistance being a 30-foot tall, fully animatronic Super Hulk, who was going to be the film's most formidable villain. He says, It was a smorgasbord of amazing effects, and the rug got pulled out from under us, and it was a very sad day. John called me up on the phone one afternoon, and he goes, Universal's just pulled the plug on the Hulk. You know what the worst thing about it was? I then had to go out to my team of 50 artists and engineers and say, the movie's over, go home. It was devastating. And it wasn't about the money. It was about the passion for our art and not being able to show the world what we had been so excited to come to work and do every day for six months. With Hensley onto other ventures, the Hulk was now without a script. It was third time lucky for writer Michael France, who was brought back to write a fresh draft that would receive an uncredited reworking by Michael Tolkien in January 2000. In Michael France's newly revised script, we meet a Bruce Banner plagued by reoccurring nightmares and repressed anger. His work for the Department of Energy sees him researching the notion that the entire universe was first ignited by a brilliant gamma burst of energy. 
that a gamma halo surrounds our galaxy and that gamma rays are the strongest, most potent source of energy in the entire solar system. Banner holds a presentation to secure funding from the government. General Ross and Major Talbot are present on behalf of the military. Working reluctantly in Banner's shadow is his jealous assistant, Dr. Samuel Stearns. The presentation begins. Banner's impassioned speech promotes the idea of pinpoint surgical laser treatments and advanced gene therapy. Banner's pitch is successful and funding is secured. We meet Carl Creel, a mysterious character who was present at Banner's pitch and now armed, he effectively breaks into the Gamma Sphere control room and begins to download all of the private data concerning Banner's research. Creel exits activating the gamma sphere to self-detonate. Dr. Stearns is trapped within the chamber as it begins to sway and fall apart. Banner rescues Stearns as the control room explodes around them. Both men are blasted by a thousand terawatts of power. As the computer core crashes and shatters, Stearns is thrown back, his head submerged in radioactive ooze. Banner is trapped in the gamma cage and absorbs a galactic level gamma blast. The gamma sphere explodes. Banner awakes, none too affected. However, Stearns had began to take on the form of a grotesque gamma leper. Banner attempts to help him, but Stern mutates into a frightening form that turns inside out on itself as Banner helplessly watches. Banner and Betty Ross are tranquilizer darted, restrained, and whisked away in helicopters. Banner, restrained against his will, starts to get angry, and we sense the captors wouldn't like him when he gets angry. Banner's shirt stretches and tears at the seams as he grows, transforming into an enraged, no longer human creature. There's a roar, and we meet the Hulk. A six-foot-wide frame wound with green, cabled, steely muscles. A huge, green arm pulls apart the helicopter that carries him. The Hulk turns his captor's helicopter and arsenal into five tons of molten wreckage and debris. The Hulk leaps and saves a falling Betty. She is startled, at first afraid, then curious. Creel sits watching the news images of a burning helicopter wreckage. They were his helicopters. He sees footage of the Hulk and decides now that he doesn't want Banner dead, he'd rather keep him alive. Banner and Betty are on the run. Banner is dubbed a troubled and potentially dangerous man by the searching police and media. The Hulk, as he has now been dubbed in a tabloid sensation, with seemingly everyone having an astonishing tale to tell about a tall green monster. Meanwhile, Stearns sits straight-jacketed in his holding cell. His skull is enlarged and translucent. His skin is green. He's calm, born again. His brain reorganizes itself and shifts on a molecular and cellular level. A single neuron split into millions of neurons. Each one then multiplies into untold millions more. Creel breaks Stearns out of his cell and from the prison. He shows him around the laboratory side of the facility. Creel sells Stearns on the idea of working for him to help utilize gamma power to cure all diseases and to develop antimatter energy to help the astronauts with spacecraft propulsion. But Stearns, with a telepathic power, sees into Creel's mind, sees images of particle beam weaponry, nuclear warfare, armies of genetically engineered super soldier slaves massing for battle under Creel's control and agenda. Stearns doesn't appreciate the attempted ruse. He telekinetically disposes of the guards and, using his mind, lifts Creel off the ground and into the generator. He telepathically activates the switch. Creel is trapped. Banner arrives. He tries to stop Stearns. Stearns instead uses his mind to cure the Banner of the Hulk by manipulating the control of his molecules. Creel emerges. He has an uncanny ability to absorb and become whatever surface or substance he comes into contact with. Creel is under Stearns' mental control and instruction. Banner hulks out. He takes on the army, he battles tanks and dodges missiles. He outruns assault helicopters. Hulk arrives in Las Vegas, crashing through the strip of lights and sending traffic in all directions. Stearns appears. He fires a weapon at the Hulk, a concentrated beam of gamma energy that turns the raging Hulk back into a weakening banner. 
Stearns wants to cleanse the world of its human inhabitants by sealing the Earth in a gamma halo so that the planet is bathed in eternal light and he can be the leader of his own personal paradise. Stearns has built an antimatter reactor. Figuring to eliminate 90% of the population today will prevent an inevitable 100% extinction of humans further down the line. Creel arrives at the lab. He moves through the door by literally absorbing it and passing through it. Banner flees, unable to summon the Hulk. He runs. Creel chases, toying with him. Banner tilts a high shelf of chemicals. They crash down and Creel tries to absorb them all. His body reacts. It's too much. One part boils when another part is ice. One part is acid. He's too brittle to support himself as he thrashes angrily and helplessly around. He absorbs nitroglycerin and detonates from within in an explosion that turns him into a living fireball, blasting through the wall. Banner finds cover. He's trapped within the gamma cage again. Outside, the sky is turning green as a green shadow covers Vegas in a gamma lightning storm. Stearns has initiated Judgment Day. Banner is trapped in the reactor. His own personal demons start to dance through his mind. His abusive father. The figure in his nightmares. The death of his mother. His repressed memories. Repressed rage. Every helpless moment is bubbling to the surface. A young Banner unable to help his mother. Banner slams his fist into the side. It pulls back. It slams again harder. This time, it's green. It pulls back. It slams again. This time, the gamma sphere explodes. The Hulk. The incredible Hulk is raging and roaring more powerful than ever before. Stern transforms at will. Equal in size to the Hulk, he considers himself now the leader of the new Earth. The Hulk and the leader clash. The antimatter device begins to disintegrate in on itself. Las Vegas begins to collapse as the ground caves in around them. A gravitational pull starts to attract and consume everything and anything around it. Stearns is drawn into the air towards the spiraling black hole. Hulk leaps, attempting to save him, but Stearns is sucked into the nothingness. His last atom elongates as he vanishes out of existence. The core shrinks, the reactor collapses, and the cyclone ends. With the danger over, the Hulk leaps far away. He takes Betty to safety, and then he's finally alone. We see that this is all he ever wanted, a minute without getting shot at or blown up, just to be left alone in peace. Months later, Banner has unsuccessfully searched for a cure. On TV, an ongoing manhunt continues for Robert Bruce Banner, a rogue scientist wanted by the federal authorities for questioning. The fugitive is considered dead by many. As for the Hulk, some people argue it was all very real, and to others, he remains an urban legend. The End In recalling his experiences on the project many years later, Franz would speak of his take on the source material, ditching the 60s inspiration and instead looking to the Peter David run, saying, I knew about the comic that had been done in the 80s when Peter David wrote storylines that involved Banner's family past, that he had an abusive father and that really impacted his psychology. The background made him afraid of the anger that he's buried inside himself. I wanted to make him afraid of his anger even before he developed his little Hulk problem, so that when the Hulk does appear, it's that much more devastating. It's his nightmare of who he really is, blown up 10 feet wide and 15 feet high. I knew that the key to doing this would be to get into Banner's character instead of just the spectacle of it. A larger concern I had was that Banner was basically building the bomb to end all bombs, and it seemed to me that the guy who had the background that he had, who faced cruelty as a child, that he would want to use his skills and intelligence to make the world a better place instead of just trying to build better bomb craters. So I changed his background and made him a civil scientist who was looking at peaceful, beneficial uses for gamma rays. I thought it would make sense for him to be a guy working in the San Francisco scientific community. I suggested to Marvel that we make the movie half as expensive and twice as good by just forgetting the supervillain stuff and dealing with that. It would be the Hulk versus the military and the Hulk versus Banner. He's got to deal with these problems. When I was writing Hulk, I wanted to make Bruce Banner an extremely complex, emotionally sealed off character and to make his relationship with Betty romantic but still tragic. 
Those dramatics are difficult to make credible even when you're not bringing in large science fiction ideas. But I tried to make that work in balance with the large-scale action scenes that you have to have with Hulk. France also claimed, Someone within the universal hierarchy wasn't sure if this was a science fiction adventure or a comedy, and I kept getting directions to write both. I think that at some point when I wasn't in the room, there may have been discussions about turning it into a Jim Carrey or Adam Sandler movie. In September 2000, David Hayter, screenwriter of X-Men, X2, and Watchmen, plus a number of famously unproduced titles, was hired by the producers to discard everything that had gone before and start again. Hayter was very enthusiastic about the project, stating, It's going great. I'm really happy with it, and everybody seems happy with it. The Hulk is a bigger part of the Marvel mythology. Everybody knows the Hulk and knows his big journey. I always felt it was a cool and tragic story. We begin with Dr. Bruce Banner working on the Human Genome Project at the Berkeley University National Laboratory alongside team leader Samuel Stearns, his girlfriend Jennifer Sussman, Betty Ross, and teenager Robert Creel is in charge of computer maintenance. There's a presentation of work to General Ross Military. It's shown how with a supercharge of gamma radiation, the DNA recodes the cells, overloading them with protein, potentially leading to the instantaneous regeneration of limbs and organs. Following a series of successful trials on test frogs, the team celebrate the fact their research has, effectively, unlocked the biological universe. We meet businessman Efrain Muniz. He gives orders to Creel, who we learn has been a lab spy all along. Creel steals Banner's data. He copies the files and activates the Gamma Sphere. Banner arrives and sees what's happening. Shut it down, he yells to no avail. Green light floods the room. The team are bathed in an active gamma field of energy. The machine overloads and shuts down. The team seem to emerge unscathed, although Banner has seemed to have developed a temper. He reacts to some teenagers throwing popcorn and smoking weed in the cinema by smashing up a chair. He feels a heightened sense of perception, and a green vein now pulses unseen on his neck. Jennifer's side effects have taken on a grotesque turn. She suffers hallucinations before twisting and stretching out of shape as Stearns watches on. He himself is now changing. He's calm and unemotional. He figures that Creel is involved and goes off to find him. Banner experiences his first hulk out. Walls are smashed, classrooms are flattened, and cars are flipped around like toys. Stern's intellectual capacity is swelling to unquantifiable measures by the microsecond. Banner awakes from what felt like a dream, and yet his clothes are tattered and the bedroom furniture has been heavily bashed and splintered apart. There's rolling news coverage. Breaking news. Eyewitnesses claim a big green bear destroyed the university campus. Banner is interrogated by two military officials. The cross-examination concerns the death of Jennifer and the ensuing chaos. They shout at him. They accuse him. They make him angry. Banner's heart rate rises. The interrogation reaches fever pitch. Banner's eyes go white, wild. Thick green fingers crumple the desk like it's a piece of tinfoil. The Hulk smashes his way through walls, no time to navigate corners. Hulk bursts his way out of the building a wall at a time. Bullets bounce off the raging incredible behemoth. The Hulk leaps away, covering acres as he gathers speed. Stearns tracks down Creel. He hopes the stolen data will allow for construction of a second gamma sphere, hoping to reverse the effects curing himself and the banner. Betty tracks down a confused and tired Banner, but they are initially ambushed and taken away by helicopter. Stearns enacts revenge on Creel by strapping him into the Gamma Chamber and blasting him. He vows this time the blast will be twice as strong. Creel absorbs the blast and becomes the Absorbing Man, absorbing the properties of whatever he touches. Glass, metal, this isn't at all what Stern was expecting. In the sky, Banner hulks out and drags the helicopter to the ground. Hulk ensures Betty's safety before fending off an attack from several Apache attack helicopters as the US military declare war on the Hulk. The Hulk smashes his way through San Francisco. Stearns assumes mind control of the absorbing man. He'll use him as his own personal weapon, 
Together, they head towards the nuclear power station. The Hulk continues to get angrier. He crushes jeeps, throws tanks, leaps and catches guided missiles, and hurls them back at his aggressors. Hulk arrives at the nuclear base. He squares off against Stearns and Creel. Creel absorbs the nuclear heat and radiation, doubles his size, crashes into the Hulk, who catches him, and hurls him straight into the center of the molten core. Silent nothingness. The reaction creates an earthquake. Stearns tries to save his own life, but he is caught in the energy beam, and he evaporates in a shower of stars and light. Time passes. The news reports the occasional Hulk sighting, but for now, things are quiet. We're left with the image of Dr. Banner as he hitchhikes down an endless New Mexico highway. The end. What script have you written that we don't know about like that would really surprise people like if you said i wrote a ver i wrote a draft of or i wrote um a sequel to or a remake of or whatever what's the one that would be like wow you did that i wrote uh, the well i wrote the pitch black sequel and called it chronicles of riddick and then and then it was completely rewritten um uh, out from under me, so the, the final film was not mine. And the same thing happened with the Hulk. I, I wrote the first Hulk, but they they completely rewrote it when they went into oh, production. I, okay. Um, huh. Wow. Which was a shame. I, I worked on Iron Man for uh, a year before the first Iron Man, um, and wasn't able to arbitrate for credit for various uh, uh, union reasons, which is unfortunate. Hmm. Listen, I was angry about Iron Man when I found out that I couldn't. I wasn't even allowed to arbitrate for credit. Yeah. And these things really upset you from a, an artistic standpoint, because you put so much of yourself into it. Um, but, uh, but it's Hollywood. If you, if you hang on to that stuff, you'll really get bitter. You'll really get unhappy. And you see it with some people They they, you know, it just drives them into the ground. And, and so I, you know, I try to be pretty Zen about it. I, I think, you know, once you, take it too seriously or you're hanging your head over every last dollar, it, the stress will kill you. David Hayter penned the last draft of the Hulk screenplay before James Seamus took over, but he has not been awarded any credit. Terman and Franz penned respective drafts for the Hulk over the last decade of the film's development. The Writers Guild of America determined, through its controversial arbitration process, that the final credits will read Screenplay by John Terman and Michael Franz and James Seamus. Story by James Seamus. Hayter's draft was not deemed an entirely original draft. Screenwriter Michael Franz wrote a version of Hulk, as did John Terman and Michael Tolkien, before Hayter was even hired. He was then brought in by the producers to combine both Franz and Tolkien's drafts to the two most recent into one and add his own spin. Therefore, the draft Hayter submitted contained work by all four screenwriters and was largely a rewrite that combined the drafts by Franz and Tolkien. James Seamus was the last to be brought in, and his page one rewrite and thematic overhaul is the script that Ang Lee would shoot. A larger-than-life superhero is getting, well, larger. Production is underway right now for the movie The Hulk, and as Chris Kosat shows us, the filmmakers look to advances in computer animation to cast the star. <laughs> The story of the one big bad green character called the Incredible Hulk is back. But this time, it'll be on the big screen. On location in San Francisco is the movie's director, Ang Lee, and co-stars Academy Award winning actress Jennifer Connelly and newcomer Eric Bana playing the part of Bruce Banner. And here on the set of The Incredible Hulk, anticipation is mounting. You might ask yourself, who's landed the coveted title role? Well, thanks to the folks at ILM and computer-generated imaging, the answer is absolutely no one. There is a reason why Lou Frigno was playing the Hulk. That was the best way that you could bring the Hulk to life. And now, with CGI, with computer-generated gem imagery, uh, with, um, with the techniques that have been developed at ILM, um, we are very lucky. One of my biggest goals is, is mixing the art of drama relationship and take that along with 
special effects and action. Fan sites have various ideas about what the new Hulk will look like, but so far the likeness of the Hulk is top secret. And although the Hulk is completely computer generated, Vanna insists he will contribute to the likeness of the Hulk. I am able to influence the green guy significantly, but I can't tell you how. And made it very clear that um, it wasn't just about playing a scientist, that I would have to inform the performance of the CGI character greatly. On the set of The Incredible Hulk, Chris Kosach, Tech TV. Where to get a glimpse of the movie? Well, a 30-second trailer of the film will premiere with the release of Spider-Man, which opens wide May 3rd. The Hulk will hit theaters summer 2003. Naturally, France was pleased with the ruling, saying, John Terman and I contributed a great deal to the final film, and that fact has been lost in a lot of coverage of this movie. There's been some pretty inaccurate talk about the development of the screenplay. Intimations in some media that Seamus and Lee didn't use any scripts written before their arrival on the film. It's not true. James Shaman did a significant amount of work on the screenplay. For example, he brought in the Hulk dogs from the comic, and he made the decision to use Banner's father as a real character in the present. But he used quite a lot of the elements from John Terman's script, and quite a lot from mine, and that's why we were credited. The Hulk is a challenging property to adapt, and a great deal of that hard work was done before James Shaman came on the project. It's gratifying that this was recognised, and that we will have our screenplay credits on the film. We earned them. But Ang Lee making a comic book character. I guess I'm reaching my midlife, and it's about... <laughs> <laughs> this is explained by a midlife crisis. <laughs> At the premiere to Ang Lee's Hulk, producer Avi Arad would tell journalists that screenwriter and producer Seamus was working hard on Hulk 2. Seamus's script for the origin story had been a weave of dreams and flashbacks, a Nietzsche meditation, punctuated by Hulk transformations, with a seemingly psychotherapeutic subtext suggesting men must kill their fathers one way or another to grow up. With Hulk too, Seamus revealed that his script would even further delve into Bruce Banner's epic struggle with his inner demons, resulting in the emergence of an evil, grey-hued Hulk. Seamus also said he was toying with the idea of incorporating two possible villains, the leader and the abomination. Eric Banner went on to gain critical acclaim for his performance in Steven Spielberg's Munich. When asked at the time about reprising the role in Hulk 2, Banner responded with disinterest, telling New York Newsday, nobody is talking about a sequel. Arid immediately countered the blow by announcing, the sequel would be less Hulk, more Banner. It'll be the end of movie one, the beginning of movie two. Now he's come to terms with his life and who he is, and we can let him be now Hulk the hero. Movie one seems to have been tough on some people, but some of us think that it is one of the more courageous depictions of a comic book character. There were even rumours a sequel could be animated or directed to DVD in order to hold on to the rights. Whispers at the time suggested X-Files David Duchovny was being lined up as a potential Dr. Banner. The screenwriter Seamus would later look back on this period and remember his idea for Hulk 2 would have also included ideas of setting the story on a Native American reservation and it was all about radioactivity and that it was very political. This being a response to what Seamus now felt was a different American post-9-11, saying, There was no template for a Marvel movie at the time we went in and said, Hey, let's take the Hulk. And I went back to those early first issues, the first run that Stan Lee had done on the Hulk, and I found this crazy story of how the father murdered the mother and this kind of Oedipal patricidal insanity that drove the entire thing, and the politics of it. The Hulk is really blowback. He's a creation of American imperialism that's come back to haunt them, right? So it's all cool stuff. Okay, so that's all totally fantastic. And then we go into Universal. By the way, Universal is really the monster studio. And the Hulk is actually, when you think about it, he's aligned with this great tradition of these wonderful Universal movies from so many years ago. We want to make the deep, dark kind of Universal movie too. They're like, great, awesome, you know? Whatever. Fast forward to 9-11, where suddenly, like, there's this blowback fighting the American army in the desert. That's not cool. 
None of these ideas for a sequel would come to fruition, and in 2006, Marvel regained film rights to the Hulk from Universal Studios, thanks to a clause whereby rights revert to Marvel if principal photography or significant payments towards filming are not initiated by a specific date after the first film's release. Ang Lee's film would later be semi-sequelized and completely rebooted in Marvel Studios' own Louis Leterrier-directed The Incredible Hulk, with Edward Norton as Banner and Liv Tyler as Betty Ross. We wanted to go back to the broader sense from the comics and, and really the fugitive-type manhunt structure of the television series, which was just brilliant. Uh, it was a great structure for the Hulk. We wanted to get to that, and we wanted to, frankly, have more fun and have more action this time around uh, and really deliver the Hulk that we thought audiences wanted to see. For director Louis Leterrier, the Incredible Hulk film presented an opportunity to explore the intricate details of the lead character's search for inner peace. He just had such the right attitude and such the right idea of fun, of smashing, but at the same time, he could direct actors, and he could tell performances and tell a more emotional story. And with the Marvel films, they're never going to be primarily about action or about effects. A large portion of it will be about that, but it has to be about the characters. They can't, the characters can't get lost within the spectacle. When we find Bruce Banner at first, he, he's had a few Hulk outs, but they weren't controlled, and they didn't re remember what happened. But like, slowly throughout our movie, he's going to learn that maybe that monster within him is something that can do good. Louis thinks big. I mean, he really does think big. He talked about using handheld cameras a lot. He talked about the visual experience be uh, dirty. And by that, he meant not always, you know, perfectly composed. If there's a sense of chaos and horror film aspect to it. And I like that. You don't have to do this, please. This is insane. Betty, I've got to try. When asked if Norton had expressed any intention to resume the role again, producer Gail Ann Hurd replied, It's all going to depend on the screenplay and where his character goes in any sequel, because he does have a multi-picture deal. Hurd then spoke to MTV, saying, When I think of all the many, many villains in the Hulk universe, we've done the abomination, so wouldn't it be great to tackle the leader? is a completely different type of cerebral villain, which would give the movie a terrific new take on the character. Heard also foresaw Tim Blake Nielsen returning to play the mutilated Samson Stearns, saying, It would be a blast to put the leader in the sequel, and Tim Blake Nielsen is tremendous and a very talented filmmaker in his own right. As part of Marvel's ambitious Phase 1 slate, this Hulk would get a lot of great reviews in amongst many unenthusiastic and indifferent critics. But behind the scenes, Norton and Studio would have creative differences, and actor Mark Ruffalo would accept the role in time for the Avengers. Norton would say earlier that year, I laid out a two-film thing, the origin and then the idea of the Hulk as the conscious dreamer, the guy who can handle the trip. And they were like, that's exactly what we want. As it turned out, that wasn't what they wanted. Ultimately, they weren't going for long, dark and serious. But it doesn't matter. We had positive discussions about going on with the films. And we looked at the amount of time that would have taken. And I wasn't going to do that. I honestly would have wanted more money than they'd wanted to have paid me. But that's not why I would have wanted to do another Hulk movie anyway. Kevin had an idea of a thing that you could do, and it was remarkable. Now, it didn't happen to me on a tonal, thematic level what I wanted to spend my time doing. The popularity of the Hulk and Ruffalo's banner is now at an all-time high. After the first Avengers movie came a cameo in Iron Man 3. A full-on return came in Avengers Age of Ultron, Thor Ragnarok, and finally in Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. In 2017, Mark Ruffalo revealed that Thor Ragnarok was the start of a new Hulk trilogy, with a clear character arc through three assembled movies. About how the Hulk standalone movie, it's probably just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But by this point, looking at Thor Ragnarok, do you even want one? 
No, are you kidding me? I get to have the best time. So Marvel brought me in before we shot this, and he said, if you had a standalone Hulk movie, what would it be? And I said, it'd be this and this and this, and then this happened, and it ended like that. And he said, how about we take that mm -hmm. and we stretch that over the next three movies as your characters and Hulk character arc? And I said, that's great. <laughs> and that's what we've been doing. So I will get a standalone Hulk movie, and we will work around Universal, and we'll do it in three movies instead of one movie. So take that, Universal! <laughs> Universal Studio ownership of distribution rights remain a thorn in Marvel Studios' side. When Universal failed to begin principal photography on Hulk 2 by 2005, the rights reverted to Marvel. However, Universal retained the rights to the first refusal to distribute any Hulk film in the future. If for some reason Universal chose to forego distribution, then Disney would immediately pick up the distribution rights for the Hulk movie. So Universal has no claim at all to the production rights, and their distribution rights are dependent on exercising their options, which remains in full effect at the moment. Hulk still has an incredible amount of unexplored potential within the MCU, and nobody yet knows for certain what aspects of the vast library filmmakers will explore next. The mind boggles at the potential grandiose spectacle fans may be treated to over the coming years and decades. Titles like World War Hulk, Fool of the Hulks, Realm of Kings, Son of Hulk, Enigma Force, and then there's Secret Wars, Future Imperfect, or how about Immortal Hulk? All of these and more set as ready-made, would-be perfect storylines to develop. In all honesty, there's no end to the pre-existing or yet-to-be-imagined scenarios in which we see Dr. Banner wrestle the beast within, and here's hoping it isn't too long until the next time Big Screen Hulk finds a reason to smash. Thanks for listening. And speaking of the Hulk, there he is. Now, he may not be flesh and blood, but this is the closest we were able to come to him in a short time. I want to tell you, he was one of the hits of the show. Whoever is inside of him sure did a great job. He didn't beat up more than a few kids.